Knoll is one of the most interesting units in Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones, and the reason for that may not be immediately clear by looking at him. He joins pretty late in the game, in Chapter 15, and his combat stats are very unexciting. At a time when your best combat units like Garrick, Dussel, and Seth can easily one-round hordes of enemies, Noel is struggling to hit and facing crit from almost everyone he fights. If we compare him at 10-1 to Saleh, who either joins in the same map or a few maps earlier depending on the route, you can see why I'm not enamored with his combat. But that's not why Noel is cool. The cool thing about Noel is that he's the only shaman you get outside of possibly Yuin, and he comes ready to promote, which is nice because shamans are the only class that can promote into Summoner, which is one of Sacred Stone's more novel classes. Summoners have Dark Tome combat and low rank staves, but the real star of the show is their namesake ability Summon, which allows you to create a 1 HP phantom that can do most of what a normal unit can do, except that you don't care if they die. Immediate access to summons are Noel's biggest claim to fame, and a lot of people are very high on this function. I've often seen summoning in FE8 described as amazing, incredible, or even one of the most broken abilities in the game. But I actually don't think it's super useful in the context of FE8. When I did my Erica Route unit tier list months ago, one of the areas I got some pushback on was on putting Noel in D tier. I was going to make a video about Noel then, but I never quite got around to it. I was reminded of him recently though because I've had a couple conversations about summoning on Discord and Reddit, so I'm going to be talking about what summoning does, why it's useful, and why I think it's less valuable than it seems at a surface level. But first, a big thank you to my geckos on Patreon, and a shout out to my skinks, Red Mage Morgan, Chicken, Morg Wolf, Upscale Furry Trash, Cosplay Sylveon, Emma, Van West, Ikepoo, Lucy Sev, Romeo, and Aaron Geddon. I really appreciate all your support. And if you want to support the channel and appear in videos like this, you'll find a link to the Patreon in the video description. Okay, so before we get into how good summoning is, let's just go over how summons work. On any given turn, your summoner can move and create a phantom, provided that they don't already have an active phantom on the map. Each phantom will spawn with some variety of acts, and you can move them immediately. They may not look like it at first glance, but they can actually fly over terrain as well, and this gives summoners functionally the highest single turn movement in the game. If you want to get somewhere 11 spaces away in a single turn, a summoner plus a phantom can do that for you. Phantoms also have a weird quirk where they can't rescue units, but they can take a rescued unit from somebody else. And this has a couple benefits. First, it's an extra unit that can carry another unit over flyer-only terrain like mountains and water. Second, being able to carry a unit with a summon that you don't mind dying allows you to do some funny things. With your regular units, you may not want them to rescue a unit and then charge into a powerful enemy because the powerful enemy might kill the unit doing the rescuing. But you don't care if a phantom dies, so you can do something like hand a unit to a phantom, charge them into range of a siege tome sage, and then when the sage kills your phantom, the rescued unit will just pop out safely, ready to go whack the sage next turn. The other big feature of summons is that because they have 1 HP, meaning that any enemy can kill them, the AI loves attacking them, and it loves attacking them first. If you put two units into enemy range, they prefer to attack the phantom first. So if you put a unit in range of three enemies, and they can only survive two of them, you can send in a phantom to take one of the hits and save your unit. The main use case for this is that you can use summons to fix mistakes. If you accidentally put a unit in range of too many enemies, you can use a phantom to make the situation less dire. The last thing you get out of phantoms is that if you're really willing to slow down, they can trivialize a lot of content. As long as your summons are capable of hurting a boss, they can eventually kill them with no risk, since when they die you can just make a new one. And even if they can't hurt a boss, they can break the boss's weapon. So if you're willing to slow down for a bajillion turns, summons can trivialize any boss as long as you cleared out the surrounding area already. It should also be noted that summoners get staves on promotion, but it's E-rank staves in Chapter 15, so it's not good for much beyond the occasional heal. Still, that all sounds pretty good, right? Well, in a vacuum, yes. But it's important to look at the context of Sacred Stone's maps to see how good these features actually are in practice. And with Sacred Stone's endgame, there are a couple ways to look at it. We can look at it assuming we use warp or assuming we don't. I'll be talking about how each map looks with and without warp, since using warp to yeet a unit to go kill a boss and bypass the rest of the chapter's challenges is certainly an easy way to beat a chapter, and that should be acknowledged. But a lot of people don't like doing that, so looking at how the maps look when we don't warp is also valuable. In Chapter 15, Noel arrives and can immediately promote with the seal in the village that he starts near. And he can do a little bit on this map. 
Summons have some nice utility here since they can walk over the desert unimpeded, but importantly, a lot of the combat in this map doesn't actually happen on the desert, it happens on the strips of normal terrain on the north and south side of the map. Still, there is some combat to do in the desert, and if you're playing Ephraim route, getting a phantom up to the north side of the map to help distract the enemies from Erika can be helpful. I would say Null has minor, but useful contributions on this map. Though, you want to be a little careful not to park phantoms on desert item spaces, because if they pick up a desert item here, there's no way to get it back off of them. Chapter 16 is an interesting one. It's the first map we have warp for, and it is warpable, but doing so is somewhat complicated, and doing it ASAP can actually involve a null phantom take drop. So that's pretty cool. However, the really fast warp skips that I've seen and tried for this map either aren't super reliable or use multiple uses of the warp staff, so whether you actually want to use the warp here will depend on what you value in a strategy. If you want maximum reliability, you might not want to warp skip this one. I didn't in either of my Iron Mans of the game. So with that being said, this seems like it would be a good map for a summoner. Played without warping, there's a lot of combat to do and lots of enemies to bait or AI manipulate. But here's the problem, and this is going to be an ongoing trend with the summoner. You know who else can bait enemies? Everyone. The reason you might want to bait with a phantom is if the baiting is too dangerous for someone else to do, or if using the phantom allows you to move a different unit forward in a more safe manner. If a group of enemies is likely to kill your best combat units, baiting with a phantom is good. However, if Seth or another combat unit could just one-round that group of enemies on enemy phase, which they usually can, then baiting with a phantom is actually bad. The phantom isn't making your combat unit any safer, and the phantom probably isn't going to kill the enemy that they baited. So now the enemy is still there on player phase when if you had just baited it with a combat unit, they would be dead. And this is the big issue with summoners. A lot of what they do to manipulate the AI isn't useful when you could just be using one of your strong combat units to kill the enemy instead. In a more difficult game, baiting an enemy safely would be pretty helpful, but when the enemies aren't that tough and your combat units can just kill them, baiting with a phantom isn't actually that helpful. Where summons can be useful on this map is for eating attacks from the siege tomes. This is less of a big deal on the Ephraim version of Chapter 16, where the Siege Tomes are Eclipses, but in the Erika route version of the map, the Siege Tome enemies are Sages, and one of them has a Bolting. A summon eating a Bolting for you is nice, although the problem of Siege Tomes can also be resolved with a Barrier or Pure Water on a decent combat unit, so pretty minor contributions on this map, but not nothing. Chapter 17 is the first map where you don't need your summoner to do anything if you warp it, and warp is pretty easy regardless of your team composition. On screen is the method I used in my most recent Iron Man, and since I was missing Seth, I just used Joshua for the boss kill. Strategies like this one even have a good chance of saving you the warp, because if Joshua crits on either of his attacks, you don't need to warp Tethys at the end to give him another round of combat. Your other units in this strategy will just be running around the map getting whatever enemy droppables you deem important. I like to get the Guiding Ring and the Brave Axe. The only things the summons really have to do here is that you could get one up to Cyrene to eat an attack from one of the druids that spawn to her right. She has a chance of dying if no one is there to divert an attack or help her, and summons aren't the only way to do this, but it is something you can do with one. If you don't warp this map and you don't want to flyer drop someone over to the boss, you might be able to find some things for a summon to do. There's lots of flyer terrain on the map, but the enemies do largely come to you. If you're playing the map quickly, which I would argue is the easiest way to play the map because then you can get it done before all of the enemies converge on you in the green units, you're gonna have to go out over the flyer terrain and kill the enemies that drop useful items. But a summon isn't gonna help you too much with this beyond maybe providing a small amount of chip on an enemy, both because they're unlikely to be able to kill an enemy on their own, and because even if they could, you wouldn't want them to kill an enemy with a droppable item because then you couldn't get the item off of them. You could use a phantom to drop someone over the river, but at this point in the game you have four flyers available to you, and the map isn't that big, so you probably don't need a fifth flyer that can participate in take drop chains. If you're struggling with keeping the green units alive, you could have a summon hold one of them so that if an enemy sneaks by your defenses they can take an extra hit, and that's not a bad use of a summon. But again, a lot of the jobs that seem like they could be performed by a summon on this map are better performed by other units. Things like the group of flyers on the top left seem like a good opportunity to use a summon as a distraction, but it's easier to just hand your best flyer the dragon spear and let them kill the flyers instead. So the main thing you get out of summons on this map is chipping enemies and maybe slowing down some enemy groups by putting a summon in their way each turn. 
If you want to steal the Draco shield from the Berserker, using a summon to distract from your thief might be useful. So, like the last couple maps, there are some minor uses for summons here, but nothing terribly important. Next up is Chapter 18, and this is the big one for summoners. On this map, there are tons of little eggs that are slowly hatching as each turn progresses. So the goal is to get to the eggs as quickly as possible and break them before they hatch. The map also features a number of stone and siege tome gorgons and a lot of cliffs and gaps that flyers can get over. This is basically a perfect situation for summoners. High move is valued so you can get to eggs quickly, eggs don't counter attack so summons can kill multiple of them, and the ability to fly over gaps is valued. Even the ability to bait enemies is valued here. A summon eating a siege tome lets your other units move faster safely, meaning you get to more eggs before they hatch. The map also has area-based reinforcements around some of the eggs, and phantoms can trigger those safely. This is especially nice if you're playing the map for the first time and you aren't sure where the reinforcement triggers are. Phantoms can check them for you and prevent you from getting jump scared. Like Chapter 17, Chapter 18 is a map that encourages you to go fast because you don't want the eggs to hatch. But unlike Chapter 17, summons actually help you go faster and safer here. So this is the map where summoners have the strongest showing in Sacred Stones. But then we're back to another map where summons don't help as much in Chapter 19. 19 is a defend or kill boss map, and there are two really great, reliable ways to clear this map. One is that you can just warp a boss killer over to Reeve in the bottom left corner and be out of the map ASAP. The second is that you can pick up the green unit you're meant to be protecting and move him into any of the rooms on the side of the map, all of which have a one or two tile choke point, then you just put your two tankiest units in the choke point. You can unequip them to prevent suffering from success if you want, or leave them equipped if you can't resist that juicy experience they could be getting. Apply pure water and healing as needed, and you're good to go. In either of these two methods for beating the map, a summon isn't going to do too much. The main value you get out of them might be distracting an enemy while you make your way from the start to the treasure room, or while you set up your warp if you don't warp on turn one. Where summoners might be a little more useful is if you really want all of the treasure on this map. Because if you want all the treasure, you might be staying on the map longer and you'll be doing more combat. A summon probably still isn't that important as long as you have 3-4 to four decent combat units, which you probably do because the game just gives you that many good combat units. But maybe you missed one or one died, and then a summon might be useful to slow down the flow of enemies. If you aren't familiar with the map, summons can also be nice for sending them into the Fog of War to see what's going on there. And summons could also be useful in the specific niche of wanting the light brand that you get if enough green units survive the map, but not wanting to warp the map, which is the easiest way to get that light brand. I don't personally put that much value in getting all of the treasure because the treasure is not that important. The most appealing ones to me are the speed wing in the left treasure room and the bolting in the right treasure room. These are good items, but the game is almost over, and you probably already have the stats and tools that you need for the last couple chapters if you made it this far. Additionally, the strategy where you pick up the green unit and go defend a treasure room already gets you half the treasure, so you really only need to hit both treasure rooms if you want both the bolting and the speed wing. And if you do want both, summoners have a bit more of a use case on this map. After Chapter 19 is a whopper of a map in Chapter 20, Darkling Woods. This map is absolutely loaded with enemies, and there are a few siege tomes on the map as well. So, this seems like a pretty good map for summoners. And there are a couple ways you can play this map. The first is that you could warp or flyer drop a unit from the right side of the map onto the little patch of land the boss is on. This still requires you to do a little combat on the top right of the map, or fly over the mountains that you start near. Either way, the combat you do in this method of completing the map is pretty easy, and you mostly avoid the long-range magic. Summoners don't have much to do if you take this approach to the map. If you take a while to get your warp set up, they can help distract some enemies while you do that. The second way you could do this map is to travel all the way around the top or bottom of the map and loop back around to the boss. Personally, I think this method of playing the map is incredibly dull, because you will be fighting about 8 billion enemies, most of which aren't threatening to any of your combat units. A bunch of reinforcements will spawn, and the whole thing will take an hour or two out of your day. However, if you do want to do the map this way, the nicest thing summons can do here is eat siege magic uses from arch moguls. Your good combat units can handle all the enemies on the way to the boss, but taking a little heat off them by drawing siege tome fire is nice. Summons can also be useful here if you had a lot of deaths and thus do not have great combat units available to you. 
Finally, we have the last map of Sacred Stones, and it's a lot like the previous one in that you can either warp it or fight a bunch of enemies. So the situation for summoners is pretty similar to the last map. One major difference, though, is that if you want to reliably warp the final chapter, you need a somewhat specific setup involving a high magic warper, a unit that can two-round Leon, and a Latona staff. The combat unit's the easy part. Burr can do that for you with some quick leveling. But it's possible that you won't have a warper with enough magic. Point being, there's a higher chance that immediately warping this map is not an option compared to the last two. This is also the last map in the game, so you could be out of warps at this point depending on how aggressively you used them. So, when playing this map without warp, which you may have to do even if you don't want to, there are some pretty strong enemies like Draco Zombies that you might be interested in baiting with a summon, but again, anyone can bait enemies. The Draco Zombies are unlikely to be able to one-shot your good combat units, so those good combat units can bait them just as easily as a summon can. Summons can be nice for eating an attack from some of the Gorgons at the top of the map, though, as a couple of them have siege tomes and can pack a punch. So like the last map, summoners have some minor uses here, and I would say they're even a bit better here because the enemies are just a bit tougher than they were on the last map. After this, we have the final fight with Fomortis, and summoners don't do anything here, but I don't think that's a point against them because the Fomortis fight is more of a victory lap than a traditional map, so I don't think it's really a problem that summoners don't do anything here. So looking at the maps that exist in Sacred Stones after we get Null, Summoner has a pretty good map in Chapter 18 and has minor uses in other maps, slightly more if you aren't warping them. But ultimately, a lot of the strengths of Summoner just aren't super relevant in this maps. They can bait enemies, but your best units can also bait enemies, and even better, they usually kill the enemy units that they bait. Manipulating AI sounds great on paper, but how often is it actually better than putting Garrick in front of the enemy and having him kill them on enemy phase? Summoners often feel good to use because you feel kind of clever when you use them to manipulate the AI. But in most cases, your good combat units can do the same thing but better by sitting in range of the enemy, baiting them just like the Phantom would, but killing them on the counterattack. Phantom Rescue Drop Utility is also good, but they're a little awkward because they can't just rescue, they have to be handed a unit, and they only have five moves, so often any of your flyers are just better at this job as well. Though sometimes you really appreciate that you can get a Phantom 11 spaces from where a summoner is at the start of a turn. That's a nice feature that summoners have. In a more difficult game, or in a game where the player has less access to flyers, I could see summoners being very good. In something like Shadow Dragon Hard 5, for instance, being able to bait enemies that are otherwise very dangerous to your player units would be awesome. But in Sacred Stones, the enemies aren't that dangerous to your player units, so in that context, summons don't have a lot of super important tasks to do. Plus, summoners are only even available for around 6 chapters, barring training you in a ton, and those 6 chapters are when your combat units are at their strongest with legendary weapons, and when chapters are easier to skip than at any point before chapter 15. With all that being said, summoners are not bad, and in fact, you should probably use one in most playthroughs of Sacred Stones. Sacred Stones is a game that gives you plenty of deployment slots, certainly more slots than you need for combat units, so even though what you get out of a summoner isn't that important, it's better than what you'd be getting out of deploying an additional combat unit. If a summoner distracts one enemy, chips an enemy once, or helps with one rescue drop per map, that's more than you would be getting out of your 6th best combat unit in most cases. Having one good map and minor utility in other maps is more than enough reason to use a summoner on those maps, but the way that we gas up summoner as an amazing broken class in FE8 has gotten a little out of hand. And an example of what I mean is the way we talk about Cyrene versus the way we talk about Null. Cyrene's actually a very similar unit to Null in terms of the size of their contributions. She has a very good Chapter 18 where her flyer utility allows her to get to eggs quickly and do rescue drops, and then in other maps she has minor utility as a rescue dropper or doing occasional filler combat against weak monsters. This isn't terribly different in terms of value from what you're getting out of Null. And yet, people usually talk about Cyrene as if she's a trash unit, and Null as if he's significantly better. That said, I mentioned earlier that there are some contexts where summoners might be more valuable, and I think that's part of why people like summoners more than some of the other filler units in Sacred Stones. The big context where summoners are nice is when you're playing the game for the first time blind. In that context, you don't know where reinforcements spawn, you might not have a strong grasp on what enemies are dangerous, and you don't know about things like being able to end Chapter 19 by killing Reef. So summoners can be a little nice here since you'll likely be spending more time on maps. 
Additionally, phantoms can manipulate the AI if you make a mistake and put a unit in a little too much danger, and mistakes are going to be more common on your first playthrough. I don't think it makes a huge difference in terms of how good summoners are, but they do get a bit more value in a blind playthrough. Another context where summoners get a bit more value is in Iron Man runs. In an Iron Man, it's more possible for some of your good combat units to be dead, so you may be using weaker combat units than usual. And this makes the enemies more relatively dangerous to your army. And when enemies are more dangerous, being able to bait enemies safely becomes more valuable. Additionally, in a normal run, you might not worry about something like an enemy having 2% crit on one of your units when you bait an enemy, but in an Iron Man, that 2% crit is a lot scarier since it can permanently kill the unit. So you might be more inclined to use a summon to bait the enemy instead when they have those low percent crits. For similar reasons, summoners can also be nice if you just want to use weaker combat units. Sure, Seth and Garrick can bait all of the enemies they want and be fine, but maybe you're like me and you really like Erica and you want to use her. Well, she's a lot less bulky, so a summon might come in handy to lower the number of enemies that can attack her on an enemy phase. The last context I want to talk about is one where people say summoners excel, but I disagree, and that's when you play at a super slow pace. At a really slow pace, you could do things like have summons kill difficult enemies by just making a new one every turn after the last one dies, or you could bait every enemy one by one with summons and never have to do any calculations because who cares if a summon dies. I have two issues with saying that summoners excel in this context. The first issue is practical, and the second is more an issue of inconsistency with how we talk about summoners compared to other units. The practical issue is that while we can trivialize the game by taking it super slow and fighting enemies one at a time where possible, we don't actually need summoners to do that. If we're playing at a super slow pace and fighting every enemy, we'll have super high-leveled units before summoner even becomes available. And our super-powered units aren't going to have any problem killing enemies just like summons won't. The second issue is that I feel that the summoners are really good when you play slow argument is a bit of grace that we don't seem to give other units in Sacred Stones. When you talk about units like loot, people are quick to point out that it's difficult to train her without slowing down, or we'll talk about how Natasha struggles to build her staff rank. But then sometimes those same people will talk about how we can use Null to bait enemies one by one. And these positions seem opposed to me. Either we play really slow, in which case every unit has time to train and can trivialize the game and summoners aren't doing much special, or we don't play really slow and baiting units one at a time isn't terribly valuable. So I don't think that playing a lot slower makes summoners a lot more valuable unless we're playing the game at a normal pace and then suddenly slowing down as soon as we get null. Anyway, that's why I don't think summoners are super strong in FE8, even though they're pretty fun to use. What they can do on paper is pretty exciting, but it's important to look at the context of the game as well, and how often the strengths of the class are actually super valuable. You definitely should use one sometimes to fill out the last few slots in your army, because you get enough deployment slots, and there are little things they can do on each map. But I think the rhetoric around summons being busted and amazing has gone a little too far. What do you think though, am I totally wrong and summoners actually are busted? Let me know in the comments, and if you liked the video and you want to see more like it, consider hitting the like or subscribe button. If you want to chat about Fire Emblem more, consider checking out the community discord linked in the video description. Either way, thanks for hanging out, and have yourself a lovely week.